This is the Geek Speak Show. <laughs> Welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Interviews with the movers and shakers in geek culture. Hey, this is Todd McFarlane, creator of Spawn, and one of the original founders of Image Comics. I'm Zach Whedon. This is Mark Zickby, writer, producer, and director of Space Command. Hi, this is George Ascienti. I'm Ralph Bakshi. Hi, I'm Chris Hardwick. People who get it, get it. God bless the geek. They're listening. You're consuming. You're watching it with your ears. Oh, just listen. The Geek Speak Show is powered by Collider.com, GeekTyrant.com, Ramascreen.com, and Mightyville.com. Get ready to speak geek on the Geek Speak Show. Here's your host, Henry. How do you consume with your ears? Welcome back to the Geek Speak Show. I had a long, scary Halloween, kick off the Halloween last week. You and I were there, Joel. The whole gang's here, by the way. Me. Howdy. Including Rachel. Me. Hi. What's up, guys? <laughs> but. Hi. You liked it, huh? Oh, yeah. You thought you were going to do that U-turn thing, but you actually went through the whole thing. Yeah, it was a daytime, so it wasn't that scary. You know, things did it pop was, out at you. It was pretty scary. And Jay, we still have to get you to go, no matter what you say. I, I heard that there's going to be a live band that's zombie-themed, so I want to go just for that. They yeah. were there, actually, that Oh, day. they were there? Yeah. They were, they, I think they're, it's on our video. You guys can check out our YouTube video. It's on there, our, the Behind the Screams tour. Led by Catherine Cobbs, who, by the way, will be on with us in just a few minutes and talk to us about the Fright Night stuff. Um, they were there. That that what was the band called? Do you remember? Um, I don't remember. All I remember is they had the. It was like a Skull and Bones. Yeah, they drum have set a kitschy thing. name. Of I some remember. Kind. I, yeah, I, I watched. Oh, I watched them set up. Studio. <laughs> I watched them set up, and then I watched them eat hot dogs. And then <laughs> <laughs> were they like in zombie makeup and stuff? Um, they were in costume, weren't okay. they? They were in something. We were so busy yeah. looking at the big, huge, yeah, nine foot tall crows that were walking out. And the free donuts from Psycho Donuts. Hey, yeah. shout out! <laughs> and Joel, of course, brought a whole box full of them yeah. home with him to the office. But all of that is my house. Mine. <laughs> it, well, it's yeah. in the mail, Rachel. It's in the, it's in the mail. It's on the way. Yeah. It's on the way. Oh. Like checked, I, it's in the mail. I checked the status actually right now on my phone. It's on the way. We are, by the way, still giving out Fright Nights tickets. Just listen for the word of the week. I'm not going to tell you what it is. When you, when Joel, Jay, Rachel, myself, one of the guests, anybody says whatever the word is, you're going to hear that little witch. Write it down. That's the word of the week. Two ways. Tweet it at a Geekspeak Show one or Fright Nights at the Geekspeak Show dot com. We're going to pick a winner weekly. Two passes. One to experience the curse of Sarah Winchester Maze in the dark, not in the day. It's not that scary, like Joel <laughs> said. And the walk with the flashlight tours. I went back that evening actually when the whole thing was happening. Walk with the flashlight, walk with the spirits, flashlight tour. That, that, it's kind of interesting the way they do it because um, you usually go there and you have everybody's gone through the flashlight tours. You 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 have the, the tour guide. This time around, the tour guide is you, your ears, because you're wearing a pair of headphones like we are we are right now, and it tells you turn around, look at this, boo. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Do, no, there are actually some creatures in the house. They don't jump out at you. They don't grab you or anything. But but they they they're in the background. They they make quick passes. By a window or something, so oh. they leave you thinking, did I see something, or is it just my imagination? Running away with me. Thank you. I was going to sing, but I still have that remnants of the cold. Uh, That's no, why Jay's here. We're doing that. Whatever the word of the week is, don't know, not, not going to tell you what it is, write it down, and you can experience Curse of Sarah Winchester Maze or the Flashlight Tour. It's like 100 degrees outside in San Francisco right now. I wish, Rachel, so we were over with you. Oh, you guys are making me so jealous. You're, you're making me jealous. I, I need. This is fall, so <laughs> it feels like we're about to line up for the Avengers premiere because it feels like it's the middle of July, mm-hmm. 100 degrees. But it's supposed to be cold, colder tomorrow, so it will feel like Halloween time. So again, Fright Night Sport of the Week. Listen for it. When you hear that little witch, write it down. That's your chance to win tickets to experience it yourself. <laughs> fall also means. <laughs> Our TV shows are back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. TV. For all caught up. Jay and I, last Friday, we heard from J.H. Wyman last week also <laughs> on the show. Fringe is back. Final season, but Fringe is back. The liked best it. season. Yeah. Liked it. Did you get to see it or you still haven't caught up yet? I, I haven't caught up yet. I, I'm caught okay, up. Okay, so we can't talk the previous about that. Won't spoil anything. I, I know what happens at the end of the previous season. Um, I'm through with four. Now I'm just waiting to see the first episode of five. Is it going to be on Hulu? Uh, I think it's on uh, on Fox's website already. On Fox's actually. website, yeah. so you can just right. watch it on there. I, I will check it out. See, so we won't we won't talk spoilers. We won't tell her that 
John Noble's character dies in this one. <laughs> He's lying. I can tell by the look in his eyes. <laughs> also, they could never do that to Walter. Yeah, they have that. NBC's Grimm also came back. They go head to head. The uh, the first, for 13 episodes, I'm going to watch uh, Gr- uh, Grimm. Grimm. Fringe. Uh, 40 and stuff there. Now, I'm going to watch uh, <laughs> Fringe, of course, because it's the last one. But but I watched Grimm right after. It, 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 I have I DVR them. And it's pretty good. So I it's, I like the show since last since last year. I like I like where it's going this year. It actually has a story. It's not just you know monster of the week. It actually that's has good. a story. Um, and I was actually I mean, that's a good thing to to bring up there. We don't we here on the show we don't get any extra perks because we watch the shows live or anything. I wish. Hey, we're like everybody <laughs> else. You know, we have lives. Believe it or not, we actually do have lives. We go to Friday nights. We go or go out. Like, you know, I hate hundred degree weather, but I go to the latest disco. We do go. Uh, he he goes in a time machine. I guess you got a DeLorean in your garage because his discos are long gone. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh my god! He just God. puts on his bell bottoms. Kind of like public telephone. I go to the coolest disco in town. I'm glad I'm not there for that. Actually, <laughs> yeah, you should see the little disco ball and everything we have here in the studio da, 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 da. no but, but i was gonna say uh, um, all of us we we all dvr or watch it like you mentioned on hulu or some somewhere on your smartphones is that the way everybody watches tv now really i think so i still do old school tv i mean i would watch it that's because you're a dinosaur I, Joel, I, I you watch just it, said you go to discos i watch it at the at the set time and channel <laughs> Um, I know, like, I like to watch it when it's on because I don't, I don't like to wait, but I have a ton of friends that will either DVR it and then access it from their computer or watch it on Hulu on their iPad or whatever. So watching it after the fact, I think is taking over. Yeah. yeah and plus, well, see, that's a good point. Actually, Rachel mm-hmm. brings up Do you watch the shows that you really, really like, mm-hmm. you know, live mm-hmm. or do you, unless you have some big event to go to a wedding or something. Oh uh, yeah. Or, or like work. Yeah. <laughs> or do you DV work? What's that? DVR it? <laughs> Well, I, I DVR everything because I can't stand commercials. <laughs> I love commercials. Me and Jay are very opposite about this. We, I like we'll to, have a slap fight to the death. I like to know what show. I want to buy. <laughs> well, we got to bring Jay with our watch, world. I'll watch a show before my show just so it's on and I don't miss anything. And so I wish there was a channel just for She's commercials. A human DVR. <laughs> 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 no, I was gonna say we got to bring Jay over to our world. You're a big mm. fan of commercials. Rachel is a big fan. So am I. I love TV. You gotta be. A, be you gotta be a big fan of commercials if you want to do things like this. This show because well, that's how you get paid. You're fired, I, Jay. I that's understand. why I love commercials. I understand. Tra- I, trap door. It's <laughs> just that I want to be able to choose what kind of advertisement I'm having. And during Hulu, during um, Netflix, doesn't have any commercials. But on DVD sales, on on radio, a lot of the time, uh, on Facebook, you're able to choose what you're having sold to you like you you can kind of say no this doesn't apply to me or i'm already into this and you might be interested in this so it, See, and that's why this show is custom. online because you, you can do that kind of stuff you can't do that on network network television exactly um now yeah everybody of course that that's why we have dv started with tivo when that was invented way back when dinosaurs walked the earth whatever tivo but it was it was designed obviously to, to, for you to fast forward through commercials now, that, I think, is what... You mentioned it all the time mm-hmm. on Fox, Serenity, and all the other TV shows that have been canceled before their time. That, that's why. We only have us to blame for that. Because if you're going to DVR something, networks, like I just said, they don't care about how many viewers you have. They care about how many viewers you have so they can sell those commercials. And if you don't have those viewers there, it doesn't matter that we fill Hall H at uh, Comic-Con. Yeah. They don't care about that. They care about how many, how many people fill up that their couch watching the, the show live so we can that's sell right. commercials. That's why I um, get up early on Saturday mornings because Clone Wars is now Saturday morning. So yeah, yeah. I noticed that. I was going <laughs> to ask you that because I, 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 I saw my son watching it and I was like, wait, wasn't this on Friday nights before? What, what's that all about? Why that happen? You know, I don't really know. I, I'm assuming that they moved it on Saturday morning so that more of the younger generation can watch it and I guess for the rest of us, that way we don't have to sit ready to go out and watch Clone Wars and then go out and party. <laughs> yeah, but now you have to like wake up early. On I your know. day off. When you're hungover and you're like, oh, Star Wars. But I care so it's much to watch it while it's being aired <laughs> that well, it doesn't see, matter. Here's another question, though. is Kids have that built-in radar. They knew it was at, at that time. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear any promotion for it that it was, that it was moving to Saturdays. How did you find out about it? Because uh, I looked up online when the start date was. And well, I mean, look who I'm asking. I, mean, <laughs> I researched that, okay? She used the forest to find out when it was. Yes, yes. 
But there no, is I one show. Yeah, there is one show coming in a couple of weeks that we are all are gonna watch live. October fourteenth mm-hmm. returns. AMC's The Walking Dead, <laughs> and Chris Hardwick's Talking Dead after that. <laughs> but season three, uh, season two, we've all we all agreed. You have caught up or not? I am yet? caught up. Okay, nice. so now we can spoil. I'm, yes. Absolutely, spoil away. <laughs> now we can go ahead and say that the barn burned down, and you're not gonna. Yeah, no, I. Fine, no. I kind of knew they had to go in that direction anyway. Yeah, but so season season two, we all agreed. It, it, it started kind of slow because they couldn't get out of the barn. They couldn't find Sophia. It's like okay, either find her or forget about yeah. her, or move on, something. Lost uh, there's cause. a big meme on the internet now. Uh, search for Sophia for like 19 days or something like that, and then um, the oh, the character of I think Angela is the character's name. I don't have that right. Talking about Carol, Andrea. the mom? No, 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 Andrea. Andrea. Andrea's gone for 19 minutes. Leave her for dead. <laughs> <laughs> She's a grown woman. Plus, she was kind of a downer. She's not a downer. She's my favorite. Well, not Until my she, favorite. Yeah. My favorite female character. Until she show. discovers that she can shoot, you know. Yeah. And then she has but sex with Shane. She that's becomes when she's super like, badass. Yeah. That, I mean, whatever. But we're gonna have somebody <laughs> who's even more of a badass in season three. Michelle. Oh yeah! Yes. I I saw the previews and yeah. I was like, "What the hell is that?" And, I and I, I'm one of those. I'm sure you guys, both of you guys, have since I met you guys at comic book stores. You guys have been following the the, the comic book, the Walking Dead comic book. I can't wait to see what they're going to do with the governor, or as you say, the governor. Governor. Probably because Jay's next to you and you think... Well, I saw the Gibbs trailer. He doesn't look anything like... I mean, the, the the teaser trailer for season three, Um, they show... Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, like that one dude is supposed to be the governor. He doesn't look like what he looks like in the comic books. He's very uh, clean cut. And yeah. Not, not very uh, motorcycle gang kind of... Sons yeah, of Anarchy kind of looking guy. From the comic book, I I I would have cast someone like Danny Trejo or somebody to play the government. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, because that that that's what the way they drew. I'll him play him, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's coming in a couple of weeks. Um, Revolution. Uh, I'll be honest. I, again, going back to the DVR thing, I haven't seen this, the the third episode, the new one that that just came out. I'm going to watch either, it. But I actually I did watched watch it last two night. Last night. Uh, so I I've decided that. Anytime the uncle character, the Han Solo looking dude. Uncle Jesse. Yeah, <laughs> Uncle Jesse. I just call him like fake Han Solo, basically. Um, or Bamf, badass mother. Shut your <laughs> mouth. But um, <laughs> anytime he or the the main villain that we've seen so Obama. far. Obama. Monroe. Yeah, the Oba- Mom- not Monroe. I, I can't stand Monroe. Monroe's actually pretty good looking. Um. He's he's too young to be the villain 15 years in the future. He's just he, he seems yeah, horribly miscast. Yeah. There's a lot of miscast. He doesn't look like evil at all. That's all I was about to say. But He looks uh, like Uncle Jesse can just take him and yeah. without even trying. He looks like Rip Uncle Joey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Uncle Jesse slash fake Han Solo. I, I love him and I love the show anytime he is on screen. But anytime anyone else is on screen, I'm just like, oh, this reminds me of other shows I wish I was watching. You know, that's a problem. Cause yeah. Ever since the pilot, I, I kept saying this. From Lost, from Fringe even. I knew, especially Lost, they had so many characters, but I knew all their names, I knew their background, and I had my favorites already by the, by the middle of, of the, the the pilot episode. And this one, I still can't, just because just Joe or, or one of you keeps saying Uncle Jesse, I know that that's his name, but the rest <laughs> no, of No, his name is Miles, name. actually, is it? guys. I don't know. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel See, knows Rachel's things. defending him. <laughs> See, if anybody, if anybody was to die in any of these episodes, it'd be like, yeah, and... Including the the protagonist, the main character, the Hunger Games looking skinny chick. Like yeah. I, I'm just like feed her. <laughs> I, her sandwich. <laughs> she's not. What? Well, don't have the militia so keeps taking their crops. Okay, she she's, doesn't have the food. <laughs> I'm sorry. She she looks like a model. All, all of the girls and the the brother character, the Luke Skywalker looking kid. Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Back me up on this, Rach. Well, they, they lost am. electricity. They didn't lose makeup. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and shampoo, <laughs> apparently. They they still have running water because everybody's perfectly clean cut and shaved and sparkling and they've got hair product. So I'm just like, this this does not look like... Well, see, the there's not all that artificial stuff to ruin it, so... Yeah, maybe, no. maybe they should rub more dirt in their face and hair. <laughs> well, here's a quick I, question I for like you guys. I would like the show a lot better. Hypothetical question. If this happened if, if the electricity and everything went out what, well to all of you what would be the most important thing that you, you just needed to have hot showers hmm I'd say a gun 
Rachel? I would say my novels of the Star Wars movie so I can read them. (laughs) <laughs> I thought you were say so you can burn them to keep B- warm. Books? <laughs> no! Books? So, yeah, because then so I can that be she the can keep her religious, like, effigy going. So so she can have all of the Star Wars uh, stories continue on into future generations. Well, you know, the electricity did go out, so that means that the, the uh, camera, security cameras are out. You know, at the Presidio, Rachel knows it. There's a Yoda statue there. Go get that. Take it. Take it. There's your altar right, right take there. Take it. It's yours. That is true. They also have a uh, life-size boba. Might take that as well. Boba drink? Okay, so <laughs> these are just hypothetical things that we're doing here. Now you got me thinking about what I want to... Lucasfilm, don't send your what clone I troopers over here. I want to use the... Uh, can I say that I want to roll a Charmin, actually? <laughs> that would be a good Episode idea. one reference, hey. Hoard toilet paper, Dean. Hoard it like it's made of gold. <laughs> yeah. Jay. Yeah? Are you ready to commentary? Um, I can be in about 30 seconds. Okay, so let's give her 30 seconds and she'll comment on comics. The Geek Speak Show will be right back. We seek her out. The one who stole our lives. We will have our revenge. And you will die. This Halloween, the most haunted place in American history comes to light at Winchester Mystery House's Fright Nights. For more details or to buy tickets, visit WinchesterMysteryHouse.com or the Winchester Mystery House box office. Go to Bay Area Togo's Restaurants for $5 off your ticket. This is the house that fear built. Comics Commentary with Jay Gibbs on the Geek Speak Show. Y'all like steampunk kids? I know I do. This week we are talking about Joe Benitez's Lady Mechanica on independent Aspen Comics. Go ahead and look up aspencomics.com when you get a chance. They've got some really good stuff uh, from the makers of Fathom. and uh, Now, Lady Mechanica is their flagship book. It's only got issues 0 through 4, I want to say, up on the stands. Um, I own one or sorry zero through three uh this is one of those rare cases where the zero issue isn't a prequel it isn't a preview it's a full length well thought out single issue story that came out before novel concept the issue one book it's not something that they went back and redid years later or even months later uh it was always planned that the books would be numbered zero one two three on and on into whatever uh the book needs more love i mean it like i said it's the flagship of uh, aspen comics right now and it's getting plenty of love at comic-con at uh steampunk conventions around the country and in europe it, it's selling like hotcakes it's a license to print money because the artwork by joe benitez who's also the writer and the creator of the comic is so fantastic the attention to detail the attention to the steampunk aesthetic the use of color and line and characterization um no two characters look the same no two characters talk the same it, you really get a sense for almost a cinematic experience in these books they're they're not perfect they're not my favorite comic they're they're not my favorite uh design of characters the the female characters do all tend to look a little bit alike but there's enough variance that you really get a sense of flow of planning of action and of really unique storytelling so i definitely recommend that you pick up lady mechanica uh the Zero Issue is a one-shot that's pretty much completely self-contained that just sets up the premise and the character of Lady Mechanica herself. She is an amnesiac hero who can't remember her life before she was made into a steampunk-style biomechanical uh, sort of sexy lady monster. And... Uh, She has claws, and uh, she wears the steampunk goggles and the leather corsets, and she runs around, and she is a uh, detective-cum-bounty hunter tracking down in the Zero Issue the Demon of Satan's Alley. And if that's not enough to get you hooked, I don't know what is. Um, It's a biomechanical monster resembling Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but with kind of a spiny metal rat tail. And... uh, she 
finds the monster and she confronts it and they fight and then after the fight she hits him with a trank dart and then he starts talking and is like why do you want to hurt me and she's like oh my god you can talk you're a sentient creature i had no idea um i thought you were just terrorizing people and eating babies and raiding villages uh my bad so she actually befriends this this monster who refers to himself as ucky and uh finds out and and we get a little exposition from uh from the zero issue she finds out that Ucky might have been made by the same creator that kidnapped Lady Mechanica from her human life and made her what she is today um this is the drive of the story is that Lady Mechanica wants to remember she wants to find out who made her and she wants to know what her real name was when she was a human girl she wants to know where she comes from if she has family, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so the zero is is probably my favorite. One is also really good. It's a, another sort of self-contained issue. Uh, it does lead into two directly, but it is the story of uh, Lady Mechanica roaming around on her way to uh, a steampunk convention that's sort of taking place with the airships and everything cool like that in the city of Mechanica, which she is named for. Um, and she's also trying to track a, uh, a young girl like herself who has mechanical claws instead of hands, very Edward Scissorhands sort of aesthetic, um, who was being hunted by a group of bounty hunters, uh, very different from Mechanica herself. We find out in three that the bounty hunters are actually Mechanica's enemies. Um, if it wasn't already readily apparent in two uh or one anyway and the the girl that mechanica was hunting i actually thought it was mechanica in the first couple of pages because the faces look alike and it's a little confusing but she's she's too young and she she doesn't have the upscale model of mechanical parts um she dies and mechanica finds the body eventually uh during the first issue and then Mechanica gets knocked out by a guy whose face we never see, but who wears a top hat and he's really creepy and shrouded in mystery and uh, takes the the girl's body away. And um, anyway, she Mechanica has a big fight with him and it's a lot of good fighting going on in the book. And uh, anytime I read any of the characters dialogue, there's phonetic accents written in. I get to hear a lot of, um, sort of bad cockney bad irish bad fake english accents because that's what steampunk kids are into and i really get a sense that i can hear actors voices in my heads i can hear like tim curry i can hear uh anthony stewart head i i can hear really specific things coming out in the dialogue and it helps differentiate the characters because there's loads and loads of characters that you need to remember in the pages of this book uh Two is a fun little romp that I finished reading this morning. I've, I've had three weeks to do this, and I, I just finished it this morning. But um, it's, uh, it introduces the idea of this sort of French-Italian Cirque du Soleil-style circus in the back couple of pages that I guess is what three and four are about. Um, we are hinted at the fact that Lady Mechanica might have been made by this guy called Mr. Kane, also known as the Engineer, and he might be the guy in the top hat who is very mysterious and shrouded in myth. So, a lot of good things going on in Lady Mechanica. Uh, apparently, Joe Benitez is having some kind of a dispute, either with Aspen Comics or its distributors, and he is not able to get either three or four out on the stands, but they are planned, they are in production, and I'm really looking forward to them. Please, please go to JoeBenitez.com, friend him on Facebook, look him up on DeviantArt. I did all of those things, you won't regret it. The artwork is great, the story is really cool. If you like steampunk, even if you just like good, strong female heroines, go out and get Joe Benitez's Lady Mechanica, Aspen Comics. Thanks, that's this week in comics commentary. I will see you next Wednesday, because Wednesday is new comic book day. It's time for the Geek Speak Show Book Club. Uh-huh. Our books are graphic novels. Tell us what your favorites are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. It is time for the book club. Two picks for me today, since I missed one a couple weeks ago, so double up on you, on you guys this, this week. 
Both of my picks are they're sequel uh, sequel to each other. Uh, one is The Magicians, the other The Magician King, both by Lev Grossman. Lev happens to be on the phone with me. Lev, welcome to the Geek Speak show. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. So this one, uh, well, I'll let you explain what it is uh, since you wrote the books. Go ahead and tell everybody what, what the two books are about. Oh, man, I suck at this. All right, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Um, the Magicians is a story about... Um, uh, a story about what? It's a story about a guy named Quentin who uh, is clever, slightly too clever for his own good, um, and he is something of of a fanboy, I guess you could say. He's a fantasy fan, and uh, he gets... Um, I, I, I began the book by granting him his deepest wish, which is that at the age of 17, he's informed that he's been accepted uh, to... That magic is real, and he's been accepted to a secret college for magic, which happens to be located in upstate New York. Uh, and he doesn't have to go to college. He'll never have to have a job uh, because he's going to be a magician instead. And, uh, you know, the first half of the book or so is about his education as a magician. And his slow he slowly comes to understand what he finds magic is very hard. It costs him a lot more than he thought it would. Uh, and it's funny. It doesn't... Um, it doesn't make him happy in the way that he thought he would. Uh, it doesn't. It solves a lot of problems, but not the fundamental underlying problems, um, sort of human existence, I guess, finding a purpose. The, the thing about Quentin is that he's not. He's not Harry Potter. He doesn't exist in a world where there's uh, there's no Voldemort there. There's no war between ultimate good and ultimate evil. There's no uh, Dumbledore to help him out. There's no Dumbledore. Uh, he has to find his own way, and he has to find out really. Um, uh, he has to figure out for himself what, what magic is for. People have talked about this book as kind of Harry Potter meets Catcher in the Rye, um, and I never would have said that, but um, hearing it said, uh, I, can see, I can see what that means. There's, there's something to that. Yeah, but actually, I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I would describe it as what, were, what we would act like if we were thrown into the Harry Potter world, the way we would react, the real people. That, that's where I see the magicians and the magician king. Well, that was the thought experiment, right? I was trying to write a story about uh, magic in a world that is where people act like they really do, and everything that exists in our world exists in that world. So these are people who go to college for magic. They get drunk all the time. They have sex with each other. They do incredibly stupid things. Um, so the way we would they, be, like I said. <laughs> it, well, exactly, right. I just tried to think, <laughs> if I gave my 17-year-old self, what kinds of stupid dish would I get up to <laughs> if I knew how to do magic? And the answer was... A hell of a lot. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that, that Quentin is, is a fanboy. Uh, he he loves fantasy. He he's he's obsessed with the uh, the the Fillory books. Now, the way did you write Quentin that way? Just because that's the character, or are you really a fanboy yourself? Also, I I was and am. Uh, but the reason you know the reason I wrote him that way was again I thought that that's how it would go. One of the things. I am a, a huge Harry Potter fan, and you know, looking for ways to kind of expand on this story about the education of a young magician, uh, I started to think, well, what would it really be like? How would it really happen? Who would really go to a school for magic? And it made me think that a lot of the people who went to that school would already be fantasy fans. They would grow up reading Narnia, they'd read Fritz Lieber, they'd read Once in Future King, and they'd read Harry Potter. Um, and it's funny because Harry gets to Hogwarts and he's never read a fantasy novel in his life, as far as I know. I don't know that fantasy novels exist in the Harry Potter universe, but I wanted them to be real in the Magician's universe. So what happens is that, you know, you have this guy, he's read all this stuff, and then he goes to a school for magic. And as you would, he spends a lot of time comparing what's really happening to him to the expectations that he had based on what he read. And it leads him to have to learn some tough lessons about how life is different from a story. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of references that you put in the you know the classics like the, there's Tolkien, there there's uh, I think one to the movies even there's uh, all kinds of references to Star Wars. I think there's also in there. Um, it, it's gonna the first thing that everybody's gonna compare it to obviously is gonna be Harry Potter. Now, th- when you got the idea for this story, was it before or after the Harry Potter stories, the books, not the movies? Well, the original original idea, the first cha- I, I wrote the first chapter of it in 1996. Uh, and that really was, uh, I can't even take credit for that. It was because I'd been reading Wizard, uh, Wizard of Earthsea, and uh, I'd been thinking about um, 
Ged's uh, education on the Isle of Roke, uh, which I always thought was the coolest part of the book. And I thought, well, what if we took that part of the book, which is like, you know, it's a couple chapters in uh, in the Le Guin novel. What if we stretched it out, you know, for a whole book? How cool would that be? Naturally, a year later, I was run over by the Hogwarts Express, <laughs> and it took me a while to figure out where I was after that and, you know, whether there was still a point to trying to tell this story. And uh, it wasn't until much later, until 2004, uh, then I decided I would I would come back to it, and you know there were still things to say. And the way you know the way I, I I sort of found a new way a new take on it was to write it as an adult novel, um, and you know leaving in all that messy stuff that um, we as adults love so much, like having sex. Yeah, now I'm, t- I'm talking to Lev Grossman. He is the author of The Magicians and The Magician King, the sequel to it. The sequel, actually, not having read it, to me, it, it, it reads like like The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, it, this is a trilogy, so I, I don't I don't know what the next one's gonna be, but it's it, there's a lot of things that go wrong, really wrong, in in the second, one, especially at the very end of the second one. Um, why why did you decide to do, to make that one a lot darker for for Quentin and for than than the first one? Well, it's it, you know it's funny. I I originally thought you know let's um, let's do uh, you know there's a lot of sort of hidden or oh, not so hidden parallels in the first one to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's kind of a coming of age story yeah. for Quentin. And then I thought, well, let's do you know let's do a different, slightly different take. Let's do a, a book that's more like Voyage of the Dawn Treader, you know, which is a little bit more of an epic. You know, everybody gets on a boat, they get to sail around. Um, I actually sort of thought it would be lighter and, and brighter than, than the first one. Um, but yeah, it veers into some pretty dark territory, and that's partly because um, there's a second major character introduced whose name is Julia. Mm-hmm. She um, is the girl who Quentin had a crush on her in high school. She takes the exam for this magic school, but she doesn't get in, and she decides that she's going to learn magic anyway. She's going to learn it on the outside, and that turns out to come with some very... Uh, at a very high price, um, and it leads her in, down some extremely dark alleys, which I, I didn't see coming necessarily. Uh, so yeah, it is quite dark. It is a bit of an Empire Strikes Back, you know, I'm your father, I'm cutting your hand off, kind of a kind of a story. I guess that's sort of the fate of middle acts of trilogies, often. But I remain resolved that the third book is going to be not as dark. Yeah, actually, the Julie character, I, I do like, I mean, she's, like you mentioned, she's in the first one, but she's really, really prominent in, in, in the second one. I do like her, her character only because it made the book even more real, because I always thought after reading her, I always thought, you know, how, how would we react if we knew that, let's say, a brother or a cousin or somebody got to go off to a magical college, but we got left behind? How, how would we feel? And we get to see how you would feel in the Julie character. It, she just it's funny she learns that magic is real she doesn't make the cut for the university and yet she can't let go of it she is so i guess she's so envious she's so angry and she's so bitter uh she 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 feels as though you know when, once if once you knew magic was real you know you'd kind of never be able to forget about it you'd always be thinking how can i break through into this world of magic that's all around me but i can't quite see it um or at least that's probably because I'm a bitter, envious person. That's probably what my experience of it would be. So, you know, I, I sort of, I went with that. And uh, um, uh, and that's where, where Julia came from. Um, and uh, as we know already from, from the first book, you know, um, she gets somewhere, but it's maybe not where she, she was hoping she would get. Right. And, and this is a trilogy. When can we expect the, the third one? That's a good. That's a good question. I asked my agent <laughs> that just the other day. Uh, the the third one is, um, I would say, four fifths written. Uh, I know a lot about it, including the ending. Um, it's not scheduled. The publisher has not um, scheduled a date for it, which is kind of a bureaucratic thing, um, and yet it prevents me from giving you a clear and not muddled answer to that question. I expect that it will come next year, late summer or fall. And that you know that there are a lot, a lot of fans, um, be, both of them bestsellers. So can you give us a little bit of what we can expect? Don't don't spoil anything, but what can we we can expect from the third one? Well, uh, you know, it it this one it goes back to Breakbills, the the college for magic that Quentin goes to mm-hmm. in the first book. I felt as though I wasn't quite done with that setting. That the setting of a college for magic is is 
so much fun, and I realized if I'm going to uh, if I'm going to you know if this is the third book, if that's all I'm ever going to write, I haven't quite told every story that I want to tell. It's set in that setting. It's just so fun, and then also because it's the third book, I kind of wanted it to come full circle a bit. Um, so it begins back at Breakbills again, um, from the point of view of somebody who we haven't met, who's an undergraduate at Breakbills. Very different sort of person from Quentin, having a very different kind of undergraduate experience than Quentin did. She's a lot happier than Quentin. Uh, so we get another look at break bills, but from a very different point of view. And then slowly, the characters that we know from the first two books begin to make their entrances. Uh, but they're not there at the very beginning. And we sort of, you sort of get this thing where you're waiting for them to arrive, and one by one, they do. Hmm. Okay. So again, we don't know when it's going to come, but it is definitely coming. Lev Grossman, author of The Magicians and The Magician King, my picks for the book club. Lev, before I let you go, let's get to know you a little bit. When did you start writing fantasy books, or how did your interest in fantasy begin? Well, I was always, I mean, I, 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 like a lot of people, I, you know, my first, the first, my first loves as a reader were fantasy novels, um, especially the Narnia books, which I was really obsessed with. Uh, but also, um, you know, Piers Anthony was a big one for me. Uh, uh, T.H. White, Fritz Lieber, and McCaffrey. Um, you know, those were the books that I read over and over and over again. Uh, but I didn't start writing fantasy until uh, I, da- I kind of dabbled in it in my 20s, but I didn't get serious about it until I was in my 30s. I had a funny kind of education in that my parents are both English professors, both very kind of high culture kind of people, very invested in the canon and the great books. Um, and they kind of frowned on fantasy. They were sort of skeptical of it. So, you know, I spent a long time. In college, I studied English. Even in grad school, I studied um, the modernist. It took me a while to kind of find my way back to that first love of fantasy and to figure out that that's where my voice was. Uh, I kind of dicked around trying to write literary fiction. I wasn't very successful at it, and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, And the reason was uh, that, as it turns out, I'm a fantasy writer. But I was very slow to figure that out. So you're going to stay with fantasy, or is there any other genre you'd, you'd like to take on? God, I would love to write science fiction. I mean, I certainly read at least as much science fiction as I read fantasy. Science fiction, for some reason, is very hard for me. I have some ideas about it and where I might take it. But uh, when I look at science fiction, when I, when I thought about The Magicians, I thought, I'd really like to read this book. I don't see it out there. I want to write this book because it's not, uh, cause no one else has written it. When I think about what I want to write in science fiction, I think, gosh... I really want to write something that's exactly like Ian Banks's culture novels, except not that, except exactly the same as that. So basically, if I wrote science fiction at this point, it would probably come out as like bad Ian Banks fan fiction, um, which, you know, I could still, <laughs> I could still write. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I'm hoping uh, maybe I'll have a better idea than that. Yeah, and I have, I have your website linked up on our, our book club page. Is there any, any other place we can see your work or, or anything, uh, all, any, other work, any, any other place we can see it? Well, I'm on Twitter. Uh, and, you know, my, my day job, which I still have one of, is uh, writing for Time magazine. So occasionally, every once in a while, I'll write something for Time, and you can find it there. Um, but, yeah, mostly stuff, the stuff about my work, about my life, it's mostly on my blog, and that's at, at levgrossman.com. Yeah, and like I said, I have that linked up on our book club section, so you all can go there. And you also have a link to the books, my picks for the book club this week, The Magicians and The Magician King. Third one on the way. Just uh, keep listening to the show, and I'll let you guys know when and it comes out. And Lev, thanks a lot for coming on. Enjoy the books. Looking forward to the third one, and you're welcome back when that comes out. Great. Thank you so much. It was a real honor to be here. Thanks, Lev. Take it easy. We'll talk to you later. Cool. That is Lev Grossman, author of The Magicians and The Magician King. Pretty good, actually. You guys should check it out. If you guys ever wondered what, it would, what Harry Potter, if you lived in the real world, what it would be like, This is these are the books for it. So, who's up next? Rachel, you want to take your Star Wars pick? I mean, your pick for this week? I don't have a Star Wars pick this week. Hooray! I mean, oh. <laughs> hey, hey. Don't worry. It'll be back. All right, but. Good. This week, I actually um, I went to the bookstore and I decided I needed some new books because I wanted to start reading something. And I went and I found Mistborn. So this is a series of books. There's three and then I, like a fourth technically. Um, but I was really drawn in by the idea that it has sort of like an alchemy theme going on. So the characters can burn different like minerals and metals and they absorb powers based on what they burn 
And they don't like they don't know that they have these powers and that nobody has been what they call mistborn for years and years and years. And it's all like dark ages as evil guys ruling and whatever. And one guy finds out by burning something that he can get these powers. And so then it's like they they re, um, re find out again, like that this kind of person, a mistborn exists and what can do. And he's got to learn everything about what they used to be able to do. So it seems really cool. It's a fantasy type of story. Um, and I bought the set of all the books because it's it's just awesome. So I started reading them and I love it so far. And it's Mistborn. Um, the author is Brandon Sanderson. So you should definitely check it out. Sanderson with an S-O-N or S- Sanderson with an S-E-N? Sanderson, Sanderson. <laughs> it's S-O-N. Okay, thank you. Sanderson. Uh, my pick for the week, Jay here, uh, is, <laughs> in case you thought I was Joel, <laughs> is... Yeah, because you guys sound so much alike. Because that's how I sound like. <laughs> I think my voice is deeper than yours, actually. It yeah. is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I'm more of a man than Joel will ever be. Um, <laughs> back to the books, back to the books. Less about my, my masculinity. <laughs> All right. Joel has very pretty hair. Um... Is super we need to give a Star Wars quote. <laughs> Thank Stay you. on target. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm not awake. I, I'm recommending Freakonomics and its direct sequel, Super Freakonomics, both by Stephen D. Levitt and Stephen, with a PH, J. Dubner. Uh, Super Freakonomics, uh, with the subtitle, this is epic win, Global Cooling, Patriotic Prostitutes, and Why Suicide Bombers Should Buy Life Insurance. This is a great nerd book, a geek book. If you're not particularly into math, but if you're into sort of pop culture and social stigma and just sort of the the cultural temperature of the universe, this is a great series to check out. Uh, there's also a documentary based off of the first one. It's got wonderful anecdotes that aren't in the books. Um, and everything in it is 100% true. It's factual. It's proven. It's not conjecture. It's not urban legends. It's real, weird, stranger than fiction stuff. And uh, that's what I like <laughs> is when you could not possibly be crazy enough to make it up, but it, it has to be true. Nice. I agree. I love that stuff. <laughs> Excellent. This is Joel speaking. <laughs> and, my, <laughs> and, and giggling my, like a schoolgirl. And, and my choice for the book club this week is something a little bit more badass. I'm talking about Old Man Logan, Woo! Woo-oo, which is by Mark Millar and one of my favorite comic book artists, Steve McNiven. Miller. Uh, Miller? Miller? It, it's Millar, Millar actually. Is Mark it? Millar with an A. Hmm. He, the creator of Kick Ass. Interesting. Okay. I know. It's okay. Right We're tomato, not tomato. <laughs> Anyways, Old Man Logan. This is uh, takes place 50 years in the future in a world where all the superheroes are dead except for Wolverine, who does, who no longer likes to be called Wolverine. He likes to just be called Logan, and uh, he's never popped. He hasn't popped popped out his claws. No snick snicks uh, since uh, since that day where all the superheroes died so there's this whole thing about like what happened to the superheroes and when you finally find out man it's crazy but there's also this whole story it's kind of like mad max where a blind hawkeye needs to smuggle something across the country wolverine now lives in sacramento and they need to go to new babylon which is uh new york so that road trip uh they got i they go through a lot of crazy stuff, and Rachel took that road trip. Did she? Oh my god, I did. How was it? <laughs> Apocalyptic. <laughs> there is nothing in the middle of the country. Let me just explain. That's called you. Wyoming. Did you stop by Hammer Falls though? And <laughs> did you see no, the world's I... biggest ball of yarn in Minnesota? Minnesota. No. Why not? No. I would. Who, she's from there. We've seen all this stuff that? before. But I, I have a question. Wait, wait, wait. So yeah. this book, yeah, you're recommending. Mm-hmm. Why is Wolverine the last superhero? <laughs> because he has healing factor and he'll never die. He's immortal. Yeah, he ages at like one tenth of normal human and aging. Plus, he's very lo- he lives a very low stress life. So he's cash, you know. <laughs> you know, he just vomit around. He yeah, I, I have <laughs> questions and, mm. and issues with that, but go on. Yep. Well, I mean, I don't want to spoil it so much, but uh, you know, 
there's a, a lot of random crazy things that they go in you know that they go through there's there's this inbred Hulk gang there's the Red Skull there's all these new kingpins there's these Venom T-Rexes that they go through and man oh man oh man it just so much and it was just like one of those like comic events that you know it was like only I think it was like issues number 66 to 72 and then it ended with a giant size special and man when I remember when, in 2008, 2009, when this, when it, when I was following it, it was just the highlight of my month, year, life, life, and then I died. It's kind of a big came back deal. to life, and now I'm talking about it. Slow year. Do you for have you, the huh? Phoenix Force, Joel? Yeah. My healing factor is really, really slow, so it takes me a couple of years to uh, <laughs> <laughs> regen. All right, so tell yet. me the name again. Old Man Logan by Mark Millar. Bub. Millar, right. Miller, Old Millar, man Miller. Logan. Oh, so those man. are our picks. Those are our picks Logan. for the book club. Again, go to the book club section. They're all on there. Suggest yours. You got a couple <laughs> of yes. I keep seeing the Ready Player ones. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, Ready Player One, Ernest Klein. He will come on. I also have Seth Graham Smith uh, coming on pretty soon for uh, the the. What do you call it? The Abraham Lincoln, not the movie, the books, all um, that stuff. Ooh. Got a few of those, but suggest yours books at thegeekspeakshow.com. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. We'll talk about your books next time. Maybe. Books. If you send them our way. We'd love to hear it. That's the Geek Speak Show Book Club. Tell us what your favorite books or graphic novels are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. Geek Movie Rewind. Movie Rewind. The movies that made you a geek. Except for the part where you didn't see them. Here's the Geek Speak Show's resident movie geek, Louise Ducre. Hello, boys and ghouls. Louise here for Movie Rewind. It's October, and that means scary movies. Well, for a lot of people. I do dig me some classic scares like The Exorcist, The Shining, or Poltergeist, but I have way too much of a wuss to deal with the current trend of documentary-style horror films like Paranormal Activity and that one other franchise that looks like Paranormal Activity... Because, um, they're scary. But, I do have a few movies that I watch every year when the days start getting shorter and spookier. Hocus Pocus, Sleepy Hollow, uh, The Crow on Devil's Night, if I can swing it. And one film that is somewhat dear to my heart is 1983's Something Wicked This Way Comes, based on the 1962 novel by the legendary Ray Bradbury. If you've not read the book or seen the film, I'd highly recommend both immediately, as October is the best possible time to read Bradbury, at all other times being the next best possible time to read Bradbury. Uh, The story of Something Wicked centers on two young boys, Will Halloway and Jim Nightshade, best friends who live in a small town where a strange and sinister traveling carnival appears during the night. The boys begin to uncover the secrets of the carnival, which appears to be granting the townspeople their most ardent desires at a price. I love this story because I've got a thing for old circuses and magic that dates back further than I can remember, and because it makes me long for the vintage middle American boyhood that, obviously, for numerous reasons, I never had. It's a dark fantasy, heavily steeped in nostalgia, much like Dandelion Wine, Bradbury's other tale that takes place in the fictional Greentown in Illinois. It's not really what I'd call a scary movie, although it does have one scene that features dozens of real tarantulas, which I would find terrifying even if they were on a National Geographic special hosted serenely by Morgan Freeman. <clears throat> but besides being a great Halloween movie you can watch with the kids, it deals with some pretty big themes, uh, such as aging and death, the relationship between a young son and his father, and the complexities of the fight between good and evil. Sort of like the criminally underwatched HBO series Carnival, but for the younger set, and less bleak. Bradbury adapted his own story for the screen. However, the director Jack Clayton and Bradbury had conflicting views on what they wanted out of the film. Bradbury naturally wanted to stick as close to his novel as possible, while Clayton wanted a more accessible film. It was being produced by Disney, after all. So, they hired another fellow to revise Bradbury's script. Blasphemy. But after test screenings didn't go very well, they brought Bradbury back on to write a new beginning and ending, and they re-edited the whole thing. The resulting film is not without its flaws. It's certainly a different animal from the book, but that's okay. I enjoy them both. There were clearly limitations to what they could do effects-wise at the time, and maybe the ending in the book was too intricate for a quick and neat cinematic climax. Nevertheless, I find it charming and always worth a rewatch. And not only because Jonathan Price is in it and he is practically perfect in every way, have we discussed how much I adore Jonathan Price 
He plays the proprietor of the traveling carnival, Mr. Dark, and he is delicious and evil and in a top hat, and actually he's my favorite thing about this movie. Pam Greer plays Mr. Dark's right-hand lady in an almost entirely different dust witch from the one in the novel, who is a twitchy blind hag and in no way foxy. But despite the odd casting, it works. Although the dust witch in the book has an ominous hot air balloon, and I do lament the lack of ominous hot air balloons in the film. Oh, but Will Holloway's poor dad who has an important role in The Boy's Adventure, is played by Jason Robards, who unfortunately I can't look at the same way after reading Lauren Bacall's autobiography. But he's very sympathetic here, sort of the soul of the film. Some actors are better than others at selling the more Bradburyan dialogue, that strange and poetic language that sounds more like how a person thinks when half asleep than how they talk to another person. Uh, the kids playing Jim and Will didn't exactly skyrocket to superstardom on the merits of their acting skills, so I'll just leave them alone. But anyway... Something Wicked This Way Comes, guys. Read the book. I know this is a feature on movies, but honestly, do yourself a favor. And then curl up on some autumnal evening with a mug of cider and a cuddly blanket and watch the movie. It's October, the spirit stores are popping up, the pumpkins are ripening, and the season is just perfect for it. Have I ever steered you wrong? For the Geek Speak Show Movie Rewind, I'm Louise Ducre. Send your comments, questions, and ideas for budget Halloween costumes to louise at thegeekspeakshow.com. That's the Geek Movie Rewind. Agree? Disagree? Send your comments or suggestions to Louise at thegeekspeakshow.com. Hi, this is Scott Marcano, Mr. Diablo, telling you to listen to the Geek Speak Show, or I'll send you to hell. Well, that's a good place to go. Welcome back to the Geek Speak Show. He will be at Ape, so will we. We'll talk more about that as uh, we get closer to the end of the show. But it is Halloween. It is that time of the year. It is fall. Hey, I wonder what that means. <laughs> it is fall, and we are doing the Friday Night's Word of the Week contest. So listen for the Word of the Week. When you hear that little witch, that's the Word of the Week. Uh, we, we, you guys saw it, literally saw it on our YouTube page. It's up there, our Behind the Screams tour of the Curse of Sarah Winchester Maze, the longest maze in the country. Joel, you made it all the way through, cause, probably because it was in the daytime. It was so scary. <laughs> yeah, but you guys can take a look at that. It, it doesn't spoil anything uh, because it, you know it, it, is, it does have live actors, so you never know where they're going to come mm. from. And on to talk about The Curse of Sarah Winchester Maze and Fright Nights in general is the show director, Catherine Cobb. She was on with us. You guys see her on, on the video. So, Catherine, welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Thank you. Thanks for coming Hello. on with us. Hey. 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 Yeah, I was saying when, when the, no when the show started, Boom. I was saying it doesn't really feel like Halloween yet just because it's been like 100 degrees outside, but it is that time of the yeah. year. It kicked off last weekend. Uh, what, what I want to start a- asking you is, you mentioned it during during the tour, but but when when do you when do you start planning the the fright nights the following year's fright nights? I would say November. <laughs> um, the minute fright nights is over, we start planning for next year. And what goes into what kind of research goes into planning it? Uh, tons of stuff. Um, the first thing we start doing is just talking about you know what what ideas we have, um, learning experiences from prior year. Um, things we want to do again or do differently or do better. Uh, and then we, you know, hash out all those ideas. We try to grab some inspiration. Um, I watch a ton of horror movies, basically, <laughs> and uh, try to come up with the, something new and different. Now, I, last year when I went through the maze, uh, a couple of times, actually, um, I remember yeah. one time Brett went through with me. Did, do you guys actually go through when the public is in there, whether they see you or not, and and, re, and judge their gauge their reactions and, and whatever makes people jump that comes back, or you or you change it, or how do how do you how do you judge what comes back or what new to add? Uh, well, we do. I I spend every night. I go through at least two or three times a night. Um, I have to for actors' notes, but also just Sorry. to see what the audience reaction is like. Um, I'll try to hide behind a group or something um, to see how their experience is going. Um, or I'll hide somewhere in the room where no one can see me and uh, and watch and see what the reaction is. And um, areas that, that get a great reaction that we hear a lot about later um, or just scare the absolute crap out of people, those areas are usually the ones that come back. Um, for example, this year, I think uh, we have two scenes that are, are very similar. We didn't change too much from the prior year. Obviously, we have to change things a little bit because it's a brand new year, but um, but yeah, so two areas that came back this year were uh, an area with the chicken farmer and the victim tourist, which Mm -hmm. last year they had nicknamed the litter box. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
That, well, I gotta say, I gotta say, without spoiling too much, my favorite yeah. scene so far this year it, it has to be the the demon room. I, I really like that one. I that room is is definitely gets gives a lot of people to uh to back out for yeah. sure. Yeah, if you if you if you're afraid of pitch black rooms with things <laughs> with red eyes in them, you might have to turn turn back in that one. It sounds like a, it, it sounds a lot like my room actually. <laughs> <laughs> I might feel at home there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we're talking to Catherine Koch, who's the show director for Fright Nights this year. So as a, as a show director, what, what exactly are your responsibilities? Um, I work on the creative team along with uh, Brett, our producer, and uh, Jeff, our production manager. So the three of us kind of kind of get together, and um, mostly what I handle are actors, uh, all the characters, all the character creation, um, how they're going to fit into all of the scenes, why they are where they are, and what their scares are going to be. Uh, and then I do the casting process, and uh, along with the rest of my team, um, Chase and Troy, they're my talent coordinators. Uh, and then we do all of the training individually, and uh, we also do a big group training called Scare School every year. Scare School? It is. <laughs> so, Catherine, what do you look for in performers? The number one thing I look for is energy. Uh, it is Ugh, a long very important. night. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it, it can be just such a long experience, a long evening. So that energy, the endurance that they have to have is just so important to them. We want them to be, you know, just as on top of things at 7 p.m. as they are at, at 1.30 in the morning. Oh, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, we have a really amazing cast this year. They have been, you know, we were a little sore this week, and obviously it's still September, and they were still scare after scare after scare, just as intense as they were on Friends and Family Night when we were packed. That, that's awesome. So. Do you work with the same cast members every year, or do you constantly hire new people? Are you looking for different aesthetics every year? Um, last year we had about 50, 59 performers. This year we have about 110. Oh, wow. Yeah. Double it. Yeah, so doubled it. Uh, definitely have new performers this year, but we're very lucky. We have a, a large percentage of our, our cast from last year back. Um, and I love I love the fact that, you know, they want to come back, they want to return, they want to perform. Um, it, it just makes the event that much better because they're already so so into what they're doing and so familiar with the style that, that we do at Fright Nights. Yeah, I was I was I was actually about to say um I I used to be part of SF casting and I got that addition. Yeah. I got that I had that addition for uh to be a scare performer. But I I, I wound up passing on it cuz uh too scary for you. I wound up working with the Geek Speak show. <laughs> That's a heartwarming story. I get lots of people from SF. It's yeah. awesome. Do they scare easily though? Like uh I was thinking like, you know, for for a performer to be working in a in a haunted house, do they get scared? Are they ever like, oh, I don't want to work in this room because it's it's too scary or it's too dark? I last okay, so last year, I mean, everyone's pretty familiar with the Winchester Mystery House and the fact that it's one of the most haunted houses in the, in America. Mm-hmm. So um. last year, <laughs> um, I had some performers who were in the fruit drying shed and. Uh, and uh, they had. They said they had some experiences. One of them said he felt like he had gotten touched, huh. like his his feet were being held down. Um, they haunted always fruit, said that huh? they, Oh yeah, the haunted, the haunted fruit drying room. <laughs> uh, they said they saw um, a little girl tying fruit, and so this year when they came back, they were like, "Please don't put us back in there." <laughs> you know, wow. we, we don't want to deal with that experience again. Um, so yeah, it was stuff like that happened, but. Um, Funny enough, when I started, I started as a performer at Universal, and uh, prior to working in the haunt industry, I was absolutely terrified of haunted houses. <laughs> yeah, now, so. now look at you now. <laughs> now look at me now. <laughs> Facing your fear, I guess. You know, and I want to ask you actually, uh, Catherine, how, how do you how do you direct an, an interactive maze? I mean, can, you can tell them you know stand here or whatever, but as you know, when you, when you're going through it, you can't predict where the where, where the uh, the audience is going to be or anything so how, how do you how do you how do you go about directing them the actors that is directing the actors um it's we do so we do scare school which is like an introduction to um not just operations but also different types of scares um like popping out um stalking scares the classic uh, tag scare. team. <laughs> yeah the classic scare um we have a new kind of scare for this year that we developed for 
for our Walk with the Spirits experience. We call the residual haunt. Ooh, that's um, a little so we, advanced yeah. scaring 101. Advanced scaring 101. <laughs> um, we, but we, we talked a little bit about just technique, and then during tech rehearsal, I work individually with each person um, in their room and explain to them, you know, what movements work for them, what their character's motivation is, um, which helps a lot of a lot of our um, mm-hmm. our actors to find out, you know, why they why they have intention with, with the movements that they're doing. Um, their final you know, exam it, 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 should be like, uh, you should <laughs> you should be like, okay, scare me, and if you can scare <laughs> me, you pass. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I tell them that every night because I, you know, when I walk through, I, I want to be scared. I want them to scare me. That's a that's a good thing. <laughs> in, in your in your research, do you get to study a lot of local lore and legends and stuff like that? Because not only is Winchester Mystery House one of the most haunted places in the United States, but San Jose as a whole has a very sort of, especially this time of year, creepy atmosphere. And there's so many great yeah. ghost stories there. Yeah, and I mean, we've looked into um, just like a few things. Obviously, Winchester Mystery House is, is our prime focal point, and I've done a lot of research um, on on the lore there and on the local lore regarding Winchester. Right. Um, to the point where I was, you know, walking through the house with, with one of my town coordinators in his first time in the house. He'd never been on a tour, and I found myself kind of giving a tour all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so and we did we do a lot of research in, into to local legend. I'd really like to get into in the next few years, you know, more branch out to local legends and tie that into Winchester as well. That's awesome. Um, do yeah. you think that Halloween and scares will ever become just a job for you? Do you think that it's something that can ever get old? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. As long, yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to find new ways to scare people and Boo! that would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, if I can find new ways to scare myself, then I'm definitely finding new ways to scare other people, too. (laughs) Is there anything that, any scene that you wouldn't, I mean, it kind of looks like no going through the mazes, but is there any scene that you wouldn't put in in, in the maze? Uh, Out of the current scenes or ever? Ever. Uh, Dried Uh, fruit, I think, is pretty scary. (laughs) (laughs) We're we're not going to see, like, Pyramid Head or anything wandering the maze. No, no, I wish, though. I really like Silent Hill. I do, too. Um, I hate spiders. I'm absolutely terrified oh, of spiders. You and me both. <laughs> I can't do it. My whole cast knows it, too, and they try to, like, play tricks on me with it all the time. <laughs> um, but no, we, we had a scene The spider in room. Art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a whole scene in concept art with giant spiders and mechanical spiders and people that were all um, caught up in cobwebs. Oh. And I'm just like, as we're designing this room, I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to do this. Do not want. You know, actually, what would be the scariest is, is if you could have people be spider walkers, kind of like in The Exorcist. That scene. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about that'd uh, be amazing. That is less creepy really to me cool. than actual physical spiders. I, I was thinking the, about the movie It at the end. Oh yeah. Oh no. Where it turns out the clown is just one big spider. Oh, Spoiler gross. alert! <laughs> 1980s movie. For anyone who hasn't seen that movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we're talking to Catherine Cobb. She is the, the uh, Fright Night show director going on. It started last week and going through the last weekend in, in November. So they got, they got a lot of time yeah. to go there. We have a link on our website on the homepage on the link section. Also, remember the Fright Night's Word of the Week. When you hear the words, we have passes for you guys to experience Curse of Sarah Winchester Mays and the Walk with the Spirits Flashlight Tour. Catherine, thanks a lot. Congratulations. No you problem. outdid yourselves from, from last year. Really got me to jump a few times. Um, and I can I can tell also the actors they, they are more, a lot more intense than they, than they were last year. I'll put it that way. So I'm really looking great forward job to it. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks, guys. So have a happy Halloween, and you are welcome back on the show anytime. Yes, come see anytime. us anytime. Ah! I would love to. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, Catherine. Take it easy. <laughs> Bye. The Geeks Big Show will return in a few moments, but will you? <laughs> <laughs> We seek her out, the one who stole our lives. We will have our revenge, and you will die. This Halloween, the most haunted place in American history comes to light at Winchester Mystery House's Fright Nights. For more details or to buy tickets, visit WinchesterMysteryHouse.com or the Winchester Mystery House box office. Go to Bay Area Togo's Restaurants for $5 off your ticket. This is the house that fear built. 
the stories behind the stories with Mark Arnold, exclusively on the Geek Speak Show. This is Mark Arnold from the Stories Behind the Stories, and today in the studio we have three guests with us. We have Josh Self, who is currently writing a comic book, and he has his long-term writing partner Orlando Rivera, who's also here writing uh, Manifest, and the illustrator is with us as well named Sam Wall, and they just finished a 120-page graphic novel called The Celestrian. We're going to be asking about that and uh, many other projects they're working on today on the stories behind the stories. So welcome to the show, guys. Hi. Thank hey, thanks. You have a very varied background from filmmaking to puppets to porn. <laughs> so what do you like best? And uh, if you say porn, well, that's, you know, fine. But, you know, I was just curious, what, what, what avenue do you, uh, what direction do you want to go with uh, your career? Well, uh, porn was always paying the bills, so that's definitely not the most favorite thing. It's the easiest way to fund our projects, personally. You got money from that, obviously, and so uh, is your first project Manifest? Tell us a little bit about that project and you know what's, what it's about and where sure. we can find that project. Um, Manifest is our first comic book that Orlando and I have written. Uh, in the past, we've just written uh, mostly films together, and... Um, and yeah, it's basically, um, it takes place in a world where artists and creative people, they're, um, when they die, their their visions and their essence of their person, it doesn't transfer to a place like heaven or something, it just becomes manifested into reality and essentially becomes another creature, another species. And so that's, that's kind of, um, you know, that's kind of how we explain things in the past that are sort of unexplainable, like Bigfoot could have been a manifest that came from somebody or even uh egyptian gods and things like that so it's kind of like um evolution but afterlife in a certain way yeah yeah that, i mean that's one of the themes that we like to explore is that uh it's another process of evolution and kind of life carrying on and how, how do you go about the writing process on this i mean do you both in, write independently or do you sit down and throw ideas back and forth tell us about the writing process for such a project well uh the way we usually collaborate is we'll brainstorm on a story and we'll go over once we feel comfortable with the structure of the story or what we want to tell then we'll individually work on like scenes that we favor more than the other and we'll kind of hand them off and go over them layer by layer so um you take scene by scene so you just pick one scene and you pick a scene and then you know you kind of join it together is that kind of how that works is that what you're saying? yeah i mean there's there's some points where there is like a, a stitching process like that um but yeah, I mean, conceptually, we're often very collaborative. And then, you know, I mean, one of my things is that if I'm going to write, I kind of need to, like, just go be alone for a little bit and <laughs> just kind of hash something out. And then I kind of bring it to Orlando and be like, all right, let me know if it's good. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how does the illustration come along, Sam? You're uh, standing here. Did you illustrate this one, too, the Manifest one? or is that? The yeah, idea? I'm the illustrator on Manifest. And uh, the Celestrian was the previous graphic novel that uh, these dudes saw that I worked on, and that kind of brought me involved with Manifest. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, free reign to design any characters? Do you have strong guidance from these two of how to of what to draw and what direction on your layout or anything like that? I got pretty good reign. But they, we, we start, we, you know, I kind of ask them, like, <clears throat> do you have any preconceived ideas of what these characters should look like? And then we have a discussion, and then I go for um, a bunch of designs, you know, roughs and stuff, and then show them those. They have their opinions. <laughs> I take those into account without my feelings getting hurt. And uh, until we go back and forth, until we come to a common happiness about you know how we feel the characters should you know move and look and be in relationship to each other and stuff like that and so far it's been a pretty smooth operation okay like we've been able to communicate to each other really well every now and then we do get stuck on something like say a creature design yeah so learning how to explain what you want out of something and visually and then giving it to somebody else to do that so that's that's been interesting and it's best, to, yeah. There's to have. It's good to have something as like a anchor or a reference to discuss and you know changes in relationship to. So usually start with you know a bunch of just vomit out drawings <laughs> and then uh, 
you know, pick and choose the parts we like and put them together. So for any of these projects, which we'll talk about some of the other ones in a minute, but uh, from concept that Josh comes up with to the writing to the artwork, how, how long is this process typically? Yeah, I mean, if you want to get into the story, Orlando and I have been working on it for about five years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we just brought, I mean, when Sam finished the Stelestrian, we pretty much snatched him up right away. And so that was uh, spring. And so, uh, yeah, as far as the, the illustrative side of things, that's been only this year. But starting May, I think. Mm. Do you uh, have a publisher for these or do you self-publish them? And how does that work? Um, uh, right now we're, we're looking for publishing. Okay. Um, and might end up self-publishing if that's the mm -hmm. route we need to go. But, I mean, the important thing to us is that we, we get it out there and we get it finished. Got it. Okay. The other important thing is that we keep the creative rights to the project. Right. So, so it's, our selection <laughs> of publishers totally. is definitely <laughs> narrow, but we'll be definitely starting off with self-publishing. So um, one of your other projects you work on is called The Stelestrian. Tell me about that project. Uh, yeah, we'll let Sam field That's that because we actually that, didn't. <clears throat> the Stelestrian is a, uh, that was, uh, it was written by a different guy, a screenwriter named J. Craig Stiles. And, um, that's that's like a it was like a 125 page graphic novel taking place in like a sci-fi military background about like a prodigal child who goes to a military camp on the moon and then the military base sort of turns against it the uh, the kid and the kid has to escape from the moon but that was just sort of the the uh my first like big comic book illustration massive storytelling project and i have known josh and orlando from way before that we worked on other stuff together but that was the the one that sort of showed that we could, you know, use Josh and Orlando's storytelling abilities and the, my drawing stuff to tell a great story of our own. So we're talking today with uh, Josh Self and Orlando Rivera, their writers and illustrator Sam Wall on the stories behind the stories. Well, I want to thank you three for showing up today, and let me give a plug for my own website. Um, you can hear this and any of uh, the stories behind the story show on funideas.50webs.com and I want to thank my guests Josh Self, Orlando Rivera and Sam Wall for joining me today. Thanks thank for having you. us. You can hear the complete story behind the stories by going to funideas.50webs.com That's 50webs.com funideas.50webs.com The stories behind the stories exclusively on the Geek Speak show. Geeking out over America's pastime. No, not baseball. The National Football League. Gridiron Fantasy Geek with Kyle Medina on the Geek Speak Show. Well, we skipped a week, week three. Look what happened. The real refs came back. They did. I think. It would have been ugly, though. There were a lot of upsets, so, so it would have been another difficult week. Well, it was ugly if you bleed green and gold like I do. <laughs> it was ugly anyway, but we're past that enough. So week four is coming up on the NFL. The uh, told you we shouldn't have had the Super Bowl in the uh, Superdome. Look what's happening. 0-4. Oh, 0-4. Oh, Did you ever at one moment yes. think that they... That's what I thought. That's what I thought. You worried for a moment. Did I worry about what? That, that the were Saints gonna were going to beat... Yeah, you know, but, the Super Bowl's in the Superdome. Why would I worry? <laughs> I guess either way, it's 0-4 for the Saints. So, let's get going. A lot of people last week said, what happened to the fantasy thing? He took a break because he was protesting that call on Monday night, too, like everybody, the rest <laughs> of the country was. So, week four is here. Let's go with position by position. Start with the quarterbacks. Quarterback. Definitely go Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers versus Don't the Colts. Don't you learn? The Colts. See, they're going against the Colts. If the Colts stop him, I mean, that was surprising against the Seahawks, but I'll take him again. I'll take Aaron Rodgers again. What did people learn this is not Aaron Rodgers' year? I, 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 I'll make a prediction I right now. MVP, Matty Ice. Keep That's, going. Who else do you have? Running back, Ray Rice. They're playing the Chiefs. He's running all over them. Wide receiver. can't see him. Go ahead. <laughs> Wide receiver, Eric Decker. I uh, like Manning. Big week last week. That's Peyton Manning. And they're going up against the the Patriots who give up a lot of points. I guess their defense has never been stellar to begin with, but I'll take Eric Decker. And defense, Baltimore over the Chiefs, of course. And the tight end. Gee, that was Jimmy a hard Graham. one. Yeah, well, 
I'm, I, I, sorry if I point out the obvious. Jimmy Graham, tight end. Uh, the Saints may be losing, but he'll be doing well. I like that right there. You're That's still, it? That's it. No, I have my team. See, my upset, very close to last upset special, or my boo-hoo pick. Was very close in the last one. Uh, Miami over the Jets. Very close. Overtime loss. But in the Thursday night game, I like Arizona over St. Louis. I like San Diego over New Orleans in the Sunday night primetime game. And Monday night, Houston over the Jets. And my boo-hoo pick of the week, Washington over my Super Bowl pick, Atlanta Falcons. You don't think they're going to be 5-0? and No, I don't think they're going to be. Last week was scary. Last week was a big win. It's going to be a letdown week, I think. And... And Washington's been really close in these games. I think Washington will pull up an upset. So there you go. That's week number four in the NFL fantasy. If you remember, again, if you go with these picks, you lose everything. It's not <laughs> Kylie's fault. That's just who he thinks. He, he And keyword being thinks. He thinks he knows football. <laughs> so that's it. We will see you again for week five. Not that we have real refs, I think, sort of. Sometimes. Well, at least not if you're playing. They look like real refs. As a Packer. Yeah. So there you go. Week four. And we'll see you next week. What's wrong? Are you scared? Don't be. It's only the Geek Speak Show. Yeah, it is only the Geek Speak Show. Any for this week. But next week, I'll be solo. I'll be all alone here. Han Solo. It's a very special episode. I won't be that Uncle Jesse Han Solo. I'll be the real Han Solo. But Han Solo. uh, Solo. It's it's a special show because (laughs) we're going to split in two. We're very amoeba-like here. Uh, The East Coast team. Neo and Rachel, you guys will cover New York Comic Con. That will be happening next weekend. Here in San Francisco, we will cover, the, the, the West Coast team, we will cover Ape Alternative Press Expo. <laughs> so check, for, check our video interviews with it. You guys have, I'm arranging it, you guys are probably going to get Marvel, you get DC also, but Marvel, make sure you ask them about Marvel now. They're... Not a reboot, but it is a reboot, but not, they're not calling it a reboot, so we don't really know what it is. Make sure you get some stuff Revamp. on that. How about that? And then ask them if they ever got my script for Joel Man. <laughs> the amazing Joel I'll Man. put that in the list. That's why they didn't return my call. I was wondering why. Um, no. Yeah, and make sure you you know give him, give him our thoughts for Stan the Man. He's uh, recuperating our generalism. He's recuperating fine. He's like Tony what Stark happened? now. He's, what happened to him? He, he had a pacemaker put in what? uh last week and he had to he had to cancel a few appearances but he's he's doing fine he tweeted to everybody and put a put a message out there i'm doing fine true Excel- believer excelsior literally this time <laughs> for the man um so that'll be happening next next weekend like i said the, the east coast team make uh, made up of uh, neo and rachel you guys will be covering new york comic Con. i'm assuming all four days you guys are gonna be there Oh, yes. All four days. We have a bunch of uh, people to talk to, interviews to do, and uh, I'm sure tons of awesome stuff to see. But if you guys are going to be there and anything that you think we definitely have to see, please tweet us at Geekspeak Show one uh, so that I can check it out. Make sure both you and you and Neil, you, bo- you guys both have, um, what do you call it, the fancy schmancy phones. Make sure you, you send some pics. Fancy, huh? All the stuff that you, that you guys take. Uh, you going to go in costume, either of you? Uh, so Chris and I are going to talk about that um, tomorrow, but I thinking at least one day I definitely want to go in costume because I have a bunch of them and they're really cool. And why would you not? It's only New York yeah. Comic Con, so, right? And over here, we will be. Joe will be there. Jay will be there. I'll be there. Mark Arnold will be there. And most of the crew will be there actually at Ape Alternative Press Expo here in San Francisco. We'll talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You guys are gonna be getting ready for the for, oh, yeah. for that, both of you. So I'll be doing the show solo next week. I will be talking to a lot of the, the exhibitors uh, and some of the panels that will be there. So to get both of you guys excited, both of you in NYCC and here in Ape. Ape, like uh. I've always said, pretty good show because you can hear, you can see the passion that everybody has for their project. It's not, you know, a studio being sending somebody there with the uh, billions of dollars, to, and you, you, you get the actors with, uh, yeah. It, it was a cool project. Uh, next, here it was a cool project. My agent here, you can actually it. hear the the, the passion and uh, for for their project, the their book, the their, their, their graphic novels, whatever it is. So you'll you'll see that uh, next weekend. And don't forget, we still have the Friday Night's Word of the Week contest going on. Going to pick. Uh, I, I think I've, I think we've said it a couple times. I think one of the guests said it earlier this week. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Got to yeah. go back. And if you missed it, if you got ADD, go go rewind the thing and, and, and listen to the show again. Listen closely for the little witch laughing, not Joel. And oh. that's <laughs> the word of the week. Tweet it. 
at a Geek Speak Show one or email it frightnights at the Geek Speak Show dot com. We'll pick a winner and send you two passes, VIP passes to check out the Curse of Sarah Winchester Maze and the Walk with the Spirits flashlight toward Fright Nights at the Winchester Ooh. Mystery House. So let's finish up. Who wants to do it this week? I do. Yeah, it's Jay's turn. All right. I'm very excited about this. Please, if you live in the San Francisco, San Jose, Bay Area, anywhere around here, come see us. Come see me. Bug me. Ask me about my comic book at Ape this weekend. Just don't hit her. Don't, don't hit me. I will be in next costume. Weekend. Oh, next weekend. Next weekend. <laughs> next weekend. Thank you. As uh, everybody's favorite redheaded Avenger, I'm, I'm going to be in costume as Black Widow. So looking Ooh. forward to the spandex. Ooh, Jay scary. Widow. <laughs> we'll quick pick that, too. <laughs> yes, we will. Tons of picks. And come back next week where we will speak more geek. Bye. Yeah. See ya. Bye. The Geek Speak Show will be back next week with a brand new episode. In the meantime, follow them on Twitter at Geek Speak Show 1. That's the number one. Become a fan on Facebook. Subscribe on iTunes. Watch special event coverage and the Geek Speak Video Show on YouTube slash Geek Speak Videos. And listen to past shows in the archive section on thegeekspeakshow.com. A big thank you to the Geek Speak Show's content providers, geektyrant.com, collider.com, ramascreen.com, and mightyville.com. The Geek Speak Show.